name is Twig Murray, and I am a member of the Smithsonian Women's Committee. I am also co-chair of Craft Optimism, um, which we're really, really excited about. This is the first year we've done it. It's, uh, as probably everybody who's tuned in knows, it's a, it's a virtual curated online maker's market. And all of the works in Craft Optimism are either made of repurposed or recycled material, are made in a sustainable manner, or in some way contribute to the important message that we need to address climate change. So today, uh, Patrick Benish Liu of Ornament Magazine was kind enough to suggest he would chair a panel. So we have uh, Harriet Estelle Berman, who is extremely well known and does wonderful things with repurposed materials. And we also have three of the artists who are featured in the Craft Optimism show that um, opens officially tomorrow, uh, April 24th through May 1st. So we have Holly Ann Mitchell, and we have Amy Flynn, and we have Wayne Nez Goswan. Um, and so I'm gonna step aside and let Patrick lead this wonderful talk. And at the end, we will take questions and answers. So for anybody who's listening, if you would like to type a question in the chat function, we will hopefully have time to get to them by the end of the talk. So take it away, Patrick. Hello, um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Patrick Benish Liu, and I'm the editor of Ornament Magazine. Um, we publish on ancient, ethnic, and contemporary jewelry and clothing, and we've had a close relationship with the Smithsonian Women's Committee for many years. Um, so I would like to get started by uh, doing a little bit of introductory questions to the rest of the panel. Um, uh, Harriet, could you introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit about the trajectory of your work over the past two decades? That too. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot longer than that, but just, you know, the more recent stuff. <laughs> All right, no problem. Uh, I started working with recycled materials in 1988, but let's say for two decades, I've been using recycled tin cans to make sculptures and jewelry, primarily from recycled tin cans. And then recently I've added the um, recycled plastic trash. Did that answer your question? It does. Could you go a little bit more into it about uh, why you chose those materials and um, uh, what you were, what the different series that you were working with uh, were about? Okay, well, I started using the, reper the recycled tin cans and then the plastic as a commentary about consumerism in our society and the co quantity of plastic and the quantity of waste in our society. And it, it actually became, it's overwhelming to me in my mind how much we actually use and throw away without thinking about it. So that was the first reason for using these recycled materials, but then there, the materials themselves become a social commentary creating, like as I'll use an example for jewelry, people wear jewelry like a wedding ring to identify them as part of a group. You wear a wedding ring because you're to identify yourself as married. But I think that people buy products to create an identity for themselves, for example, if you ever go into the store, deodorant might be packaged for men in black and green, shocking green colors. That they're kind of a, um, can you imagine a masculine attribute to deodorant? <laughs> Whereas uh, the deodorant for women might be in pastel colors or creamy off-white pearlescent. And so here, just a purely functional product has attributes in the packaging. And that was like a really simple idea, but I can look at a tin can and know from what decade it was made just by the colors or the print 
or uh, the images on the tin can. And I can expand on that. Uh, and then recently I started making, you, making jewelry from recycled plastic because I became aware of the quantities of plastic waste in our environment, which is just as true as it ever was with the, all the takeout containers for people trying to support local restaurants. And so here during this past year, we're trying to think about um, how can we support local businesses and many people buy takeout to support their local restaurant, and yet it's producing more plastic waste than ever. Yes. And so, uh, and these are just a few examples. And then that one more that's current is the problem of finding plastic gloves and masks, like on the street. I don't think anybody's gone for a walk and hasn't seen a mask thrown on the sidewalk. And so we live, we're living through a pandemic and it has repercussions at so many different levels. And our trash is only one of them. Yes. I think you have touched perfectly on uh, what craft optimism and this, this whole panel is really about. Um, uh, Wayne, um, we've, uh, we first met, I, I believe at the Herd Indian Fair and Market in Phoenix. Um, and, uh, you come from a family of jewelry makers um, and uh, also a traditional rug maker. Um, could you tell us a bit about the tradition of making in your family and how your work has evolved over the years? Sure. Um, you know, my family um, just has a long uh, history of, um, of art making um, from, geez, as far as, back as I as I'm aware of I know that like my great great uncle on my mom's side uh, was a Navajo uh, silversmith um, and from so we have jewelers to uh, rug weavers um, making the huge like 10 by 20 foot uh, um, handmade hand spun hand dyed uh, Navajo rugs um, to painters uh, my mom's uh, late cousin is R.C. Gorman, um, to my uncle, uh, who's a um, sculptor. My grandfather was a wood carver. My mother is an embroiderer. Um, my two other brothers are both jewelers. My sister is a, a works in collections at the NMAI. Um, so we're, we're all in it. Like, <laughs> we all just do art. It's, it's just like what we do, I guess. Um, so it's just what I grew up with. Uh, learning from my mom as a little kid. I, I first started when I was probably about 10 or so, just kind of uh, playing around in her shop. And, um, you know, she taught me the, uh, her, she taught me the basics of, um, of uh, silversmithing, you know, using some of the older uh, traditional tools. And um, unlike my brothers who always like to give me grief about it, um, I got to advance a little bit further into using uh, more modern uh, tools and technology and uh, was encouraged and allowed to, was allowed to go to uh, art school. Um, so I went and, and finished my uh, BFA at, um, at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And then uh, uh, recently finished my uh, MFA uh, with a minor in museum studies at the University of uh, New Mexico. And from there I expanded actually into sculpture and installation art. So um, I, I guess uh, maybe to get back to your question again about about what about um how, how your work has evolved over the years it's it's I think it's continuously always evolving I mean I, I think through um not only through myself but just generationally um I think through our our family because I mean I, I have um other cousins who are um you know builders and they make um traditional ornos I don't know if you're familiar with that um and other cousins who work in pottery and so I think it's just, um, you know, it's like a lot of a uh, give and take, you know, you, you, it's encouraged within our family uh, to continue on, to continue on these um, traditions and, um, you know, what mainstream calls craft, you know, it just is art to us and it's just part of life. You know, it's, it's not really seen anything differently, I don't think. And I think that's, um, I think 
all of the people on this panel understand um, how there's there's really this intertwining between uh, craft, art, and life that um, we as humans have been growing up with for tens of thousands of years. Um, and uh, I think probably all of you feel a draw to that and that's why you practice it today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Holly, uh, you've been making jewelry with newspaper for over 30 years now. Yeah. Um, uh, could you give us a bit of background on how you came to use this material and uh, tell us a little bit about what's involved when you're making a, a bracelet or a brooch? Oh, absolutely. I, um, back in the 1990, I was at the University of Michigan. Um, I was studying uh, fine arts and um, specifically a concentration in um, metal smithing. And, um, you know, really even through the 90s, I taught um, metal smithing and always thought that I would do traditional jewelry design with uh, traditional materials. But um, in 1990, in the spring of 1990, we had an assignment to create a piece of jewelry that didn't have any traditional materials at all. Um, no metal, no precious stones, you know. And, um, you know, they, the professor really, really pushed us to think out of the box as much as possible. So um, I, I remember, you know, many times, like from my mother's job, she uh, would get a lot of newspapers, we'd get a lot of newspapers at home and they'd stack up. And I remember seeing the Chicago Tribune, like the Sunday Chicago Tribune, it had, um, really great vivid color comic strip section that was on the outside of the paper you know out the, the outer um, section of the newspaper um, was the comic strips that was the first section that you'd see so I always saw these bright colors in the newspaper the comic strips and I just decided you know maybe I'll use that and um, you know I just I was hooked from there I made this um, neck piece that looked like a Christmas wreath that was just made of rolled up uh, comic strips and you know these uh, little beads but they were pretty fragile you know I used like rubber cement to glue the beads and you know coated the beads with um, clear nail polish and you know I mean it just it it it's it was barely functional but I got hooked on the material and um, then I just evolved for it from there and just got completely uh, um, drawn to the contrast of the colors of the comic strips and the Wall Street Journal, which was another paper she subscribed to, you know, the, um, the money and investing section. That was what it was called back then. Now I think it's just the business uh, section. But now it, back then it was called the money investing section because it had all the stock listings in it. And I love that contrast um, of the textural patterns. So, I um, began exploring that, and then I try, spent a few years trying to create jewelry that it was that was functional, you know, not just something that was aesthetically pleasing and, and you know was enjoyable and cathartic for me to make, but it was also functional, like someone could actually wear it. And um, so, like in the mid '90s, um, while I was you know earning a living, you know, teaching metalsmithing uh, to kids, I was you know trying to you know, perfect being able to make um, functional jewelry out of newspaper. And it's just over the years, it's evolved to the point where now I use pretty much every section of a newspaper, uh, I use it. And um, I use the expired coupons, the barcodes, the, um, the bright colors of the coupons, whether they're expired or, or the, you know, just the exterior of the coupons after they're clipped, the colorful patterns in the paper. I, um, I love playing with those. And in recent years, I've also um, paid more attention to not just the uh, visual um, strengths of the newspaper sections, but also the content. So I've been doing pieces that are more, rel like more about um, uh, social issues. And um, I think, I mean, I, I dabbled in it a little bit maybe in early 2000s, but in, you know, pretty much since 2017, I've made a lot of pieces that are about social issues, um, neck pieces and uh, bracelets and pins. Um, so that's pretty much what I've been doing. 
How do you um, communicate visually uh, these issues that you're addressing? Um, well, in some ways it can be, usually it's the, um, you know, specific words in headlines, you know, and, diff and the different font sizes of, of uh, headlines. Like when I did the Obama, I did a, a neck piece about the uh, Obama uh, presidency in January of 2017 um, during the week of the, the weekend of the women's march that took place. And it was just a way of me sort of, you know, de-stressing and everything. And I paid attention when I was collecting the papers to, you know, not just, you know, his name, but the size of his name or the, the, um, the images, the, the colors, like, cause there's little subtle differences and, you know, how they would look juxtaposed, you know, the black and white patterns and, and all that. So it's, it's really, it's about the, the fonts of different newspapers, like the USA Today's font, you know, juxtaposed with the New York Times font. And it's just, you know, things that no one else would pay attention to, but my crazy mind pays attention to those little crazy things. So, you know, those are, you know, that's pretty much what I, I do, so. I have an idea that everyone here pays attention to the crazy little details in their own <laughs> way. <laughs> um, Amy, so um, you've changed careers from being an illustrator to making your found object sculptures. Someone's uh, done their homework. <laughs> the Phobots. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how that transition happened and uh, why you decided to use found objects rather than like uh, traditional materials? Well, I, I think I can sum it up in one word as far as why I changed and that would be 2008. I had been a freelance illustrator for my entire career starting out with Hallmark, working for Current, well, not, sorry, not freelance right from the start, but working in-house for Hallmark and then Current and then going freelance. And in 2008, the economy went to hell and I had all this free time in my hands, but I also have uh, a background in community theater and I used to build and gather props for, the the for Raleigh Little Theater. So I was always at the flea market looking for stuff we needed and uh, some of it uh, stayed at my house and I had all this free time on my hands because no work was coming in. And I started playing with all the junk that was accumulating. And I've always had a kind of bizarre fascination with robots. And the junk just sort of started taking the form of little people and animals. And so, yeah, I have a degree in illustration, but as far as the Phobots go, I am completely self-taught. So how did that process take place? Were you like just gluing things together in the beginning or how did you learn soldering skills? Uh, actually, it, it's like every skill I picked up in my entire life just came together. And I used to make stained glass windows, so I know how to solder. And we have an old house, so I, we have a lot of tools and machinery because if you have an old house, you'd better be either rich or handy. We were handy. And uh, so I just started experimenting because, you know, there, there wasn't anybody teaching you how to do it. It just sort of happened. They, they've gotten so much better since the first ones. The first ones are deformed little freaks. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. I, I think that uh, all of us can do a little bit of um, cringing at how our earlier work was. <laughs> But I think that that's just as valuable, you know? Um, They're collector's items, folks. Yes. Um, did, uh, did it really start to change how you looked at, um, I guess, trash in a way or things that weren't seen as valuable? Um. Yes, and you know, I could I could repeat what everyone has said about you know wanting to recycle things and using found objects, you know, to keep them out of the landfill and being ecologically sound. But there's there's another reason that really drives me to use the old stuff, and that is that it's beautiful. Everything we we have nowadays we throw it away because it's ugly. 
uh, there, there's a reason why people kept these old spice tins and kitchen utensils long after they were broken or empty or useless. They were lovely. And I, I wish that that people would make packaging and and other items would make them so, so that we didn't just feel like we could throw them away. That we would look at this and say, this is too beautiful to throw away. I'm gonna do something else with it. Can I interject uh, a comment about what Amy said? Please. And that is, um, I look at packaging and I think that the older packaging, whether it was for a, a tin can for scotch tape, can you imagine? A yeah can for a roll of scotch tape well that wasn't considered beautiful in its time either it was thrown away with no concern at all about either the trash or the fact that it was attractive only now do we look back at these older tin cans and this older packaging as nostalgic or interesting and i would say that most likely the packaging now reflects our society just as much as the packaging then reflected the society in which the people were growing up. A tin, I'll go back again, to the tin can of scotch tape, plaid, scotch tape, the idea of frugality in a roll of scotch tape was just reflecting a like um, a social uh, fabric of the time and it wouldn't fly right now, but there might be something equally attractive about the packaging that we see for beautiful products like Apple and the beautiful box it comes in, which is like people give me those boxes and I find them hard to throw away. But there's other boxes that are maybe not as in quotes, beautiful as an apple, but still reflecting our social fabric. And it's, we're just looking at it with different eyes. I think that's very true. And um, uh, anyone who's had some bit of background in advertising or marketing uh, will kind of look back at these older products and perhaps realize that they were trying to grab attention with all these big words and nice script and so on. It was trying to get someone to reach out onto the shelf and buy it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, well, now that we've all had a chance to introduce ourselves, uh, I'd like to jump into the big topic of tonight's panel, which we've actually already really gotten into. Um, so Craft Optimism's mission is about raising awareness about climate change. And I'd like to hear from uh, all of you, um, about uh, what your personal perspectives about climate change are as a shared reality that we're facing and how you see craft's relationship with a more sustainable mode of living. Gigantic topic. I'll just jump in. Uh, the pieces that I've made about plastic, uh, there's just no way they, that one object made by a craftsperson can actually change the, uh, have any impact on climate change per se, but the idea of bringing awareness to the topic. So uh, I'm not changing anything by picking up trash off of the sidewalk or making a necklace out of black plastic trash, but by making the necklace out of black plastic trash, it might make people more aware of the fact that black plastic isn't recyclable. And when I tell people this, it's a really eye-opening moment, like, wow, it has a recycling number. They're sure that it does. But the reality is that black plastic, for, for the most part, is not recycled at all. And we only recycle somewhere between 9 and 17% of all plastic to start with. And so we have a lot of uh, greenwashing going on in our society today about the uh, quantities of waste that we produce. And so crafts can bring some level of awareness. Um, um, I, could, oh, I was gonna 
Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, when um, you were mentioning awareness, I I wish I could say that I that was something you know the climate you know the climate crisis being aware of that. I I don't think that I paid any attention to that you know in the probably the first decade or so that I used newspaper as a medium. I mean, I didn't, you know, I was very, it's pretty ignorant as it, you know, related to, um, you know, all things, you know, environmental, you know, I didn't pay attention to recycling newspapers. I mean, even, you know, in the nineties, I, I didn't, I mean, I remember the parts of the newspaper I didn't use, I threw them away. I mean, I'm not proud of that. I it's just like, I just wasn't aware, didn't become aware of, of that. And um, I don't, didn't even, realize that my artwork really you know allow people to like take a second look at things that they throw in the trash like you know to just encourage people to you know you know recycle rather than discarding things i don't even think you know i paid any attention to that until probably when that movie inconvenient truth came out um and when i saw saw that and i learned really what harm we were doing to this world, you know, this world we live in, you know, I, and all the gases that are emitted that, you know, from all these things piling up in landfills and stuff, it made, that is what made me aware of, you know, you know, the climate and how, you know, my artwork and, you know, can play a role in making people aware of um, being uh, eco-conscious, you know, because I was, you know, I wasn't eco-conscious, you know, before I saw that movie, I just, you know, yes, I knew that Earth Day took place, didn't pay any mind, you know, didn't really pay any mind to it until after that, you know, I, and then I paid attention to the materials that I used to create the news, the, the newspaper beads, you know, I made sure I used non-toxic materials uh, when, you know, forming them into beads rather than just grabbing chemicals that I'd been using. And, you know, I didn't, um, I, I, I made sure that, um, you know, I, explained I me, mean, you know, in my artist statements after that, you know, just take a common, you know, take a look at things that you discard without a second thought, you know, like we all should play a role in that. So I, I try very hard now, you know, to, you know, not only just recycle, but be much more aware of what I'm doing and how it impacts the environment, you know, not just, you know, in my artwork, but just in general and, you know, so I, I wish I had the, the awareness that she has. I really wish I, you know, but I, I wish I could say that, but, you know, it wasn't until after I saw a movie that, you know, I kind of woke up to, you know. Well, the movie played a role if it, if it started you thinking in 2006. Yeah. yeah. This art form, the movie played a pivotal role in bringing awareness to you and other people. So it yeah. all had to start someplace. True. True. Wayne or Amy, well, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I can kind of jump in a little bit here. Um, so I guess to be very, very honest, um, I feel like it's a confession or something, but uh, it, you know, it, um, it, it wasn't initially what kind of led me in the direction um, of my work in terms of being um, conscious, you know, about, um, about trying to use recycled materials and found objects in my work. Um, it was just kind of more out of curiosity and how to work with the material and how to um, incorporate it with some of um, the more like precious materials I was using, you know, with uh, the silver and gold and um, stones and things like that. Um, and uh, I just, I liked the way it looked. I mean, out of anything, I mean, um, as an artist, as a visual artist, that was kind of mostly what drew me to it. Um, you know, I think personally, um, you know, I, I try to be conscious about my own way I live my life ethically and being responsible of, um, you know, my consumerism, which I think is probably the biggest thing we can do um, as humans and as, as Americans. Um, and so I try to think about that within my work and how when people buy those things, I try not to market myself that way, you know, like when I'm, when I made a piece from recycled material, um, I just, I just be honest with what the material is in itself 
And I think I try to let the work speak for itself. Um, you know, I started doing uh, these, uh, making these bracelets out of um, license plates. And um, it's kind of funny to be, to the original plate that I actually ever first made out of a license plate was actually uh, from a car that my brother gave me that was, um, that wasn't running. And uh, I think I was like mad at him or something at the time. And uh, <laughs> so I had the old license plate and I just kind of just was all taking my aggression out on this plate, just hammering it. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I made a, a large uh, cuff out of it and it came out pretty cool. And I just had it sitting on my workbench and, um, and the, uh, the, um, curator time from the herd museum in phoenix um was at our shop and uh she really was like oh what's this you know really checking it out and and um you know it wasn't anything that i initially thought you know to really try and show or like emphasize you know its importance and you know look what i'm doing you know i'm repurposing this um but uh, it kind of i feel like it um kind of just started from there you know like as as a personal interest in using materials. Um, when I did a residency one time at the uh, School of Advanced Research um, here in Santa Fe, I was looking in their collections and I saw these um, old pair of um, Santo Domingo style earrings and um, they had used uh, old uh, records, like old vinyl records for the backing and then they would apply the stones on top of it. And um, I thought that was so genius in terms of like um, just creating out of necessity, I guess, you know, like just just out of, just creatively, you know, like um, using what you have really, you know, um, not necessarily trying to be like socially conscious about, I should use this, you know, I should repurpose this old vinyl record, um, which, uh, which another thing I found interesting about that was um, a lot of art shows that I used to do, particularly uh, juried um, Native American art shows, there's always these, there was these old standards of what you can use and can't use in terms of material. Um, and I think that was another huge challenge that um, maybe as a, a young, um, uh, not a rebel, but maybe, maybe a little bit of rebel of, of trying to <laughs> figure out how to work against those guidelines, you know, and say, what is, you know, how can you say what is art and what is not art? Um, so that, that's kind of how it worked, start, kind of started out for me. And then as I kind of um, kind of kept going. I mean, I feel like I've, I've gained more of a consciousness in terms of what materials I should or shouldn't use, things I try to do within my work. It's been a real growing experience. Um, and it's, I like it. I've attended different workshops, you know, and trying to um, explore that even further and, and just learn, just really learn for myself. And um, hopefully I can pass that on to, uh, you know, my students. Amy, uh, just to repeat the, the question. Um, so uh, what are your personal perspectives about climate change and craft's relationship with a more sustainable mode of living? Um, there are a lot of great thinkers and leaders and warriors for the um, for for the for ecology and uh, and many of them in the craft world and I am the court jester I'm not one of them I'm I'm trying to make people happy uh, my work is just designed to make you smile and if it makes you think a bit about recycling and about the environment, then that is, that's a bonus. But I didn't go into this thinking, I'm going to change the world one robot at a time. I'm not a saint. I just want to make people smile. I think that that's uh, something that I, I would really like to draw attention to because um, in my own experience uh, with ornament, um, so many people uh, communicate on different levels, um, not out of this kind of label, you know, intention, intentionality of being like, oh, I'm going to do this for social justice or I'm going to do this for whatever reason, other reason. And, you know, from my, um, I would say that some of the biggest recyclers in the world are like um, 
Africans who are using all these types of products in their own art and so on, or uh, Native American or Latin American communities. You know, this stuff is done naturally for them on so many levels. And um, I think that that's something very beautiful about your work, Amy, is that you're, um, you've had this passion for these objects um, that led you to doing this stuff that just made you happy and made other people happy. And some, I do have um, environmental themes. Uh, in the current Smithsonian Craft Optimism show, there are, there are two, well, they're all themed uh, about recycling, but there are two in particular that, I'm, that I created to address climate change. Uh, Greta Thunborg, Thunborg and uh, one of uh, the rescue robots. Uh, you, you have to see it. I don't have it with me, so I can't show it to you, but so I address those themes, but I'm no saint. I'm just a clown. Can I can I offer something, Patrick? Yes. From the from the perspective of craft optimism, um, we didn't feel like you have to set out to make. You don't have to be a saint to do something that's good for the environment. So even if you backed into what you do, we still think that it's a wonderful opportunity to not bombard people with scary facts and figures about climate change, but to amuse them with the robot. And if it just changes their mind or changes their perspective a tiny bit, then we just wanna take you know, the optimistic, happy view of it, that all these people, whether they're intending to or not, are creating things with repurposed or recycled or sustainable materials, and we wanna celebrate it. And um, so I think that's great. You're exactly right, Twig. And I also just want to say uh, the court jester was often the one who pointed out truths to the king. <laughs> um, so I would like to um, uh, move on to the next topic, which is that um, climate change has been a concept in the pu public sphere for quite a while now, um, back when it was first known as global warming. Um, how has everyone's understanding and view of climate change evolved over time? And uh, I think all of you have talked about it a little bit, but uh, just elaborate a bit more on how it's affected your work, either directly or indirectly. I don't know if necessarily it is, has impacted my artwork in terms of the content of my artwork or what inspires me to create my artwork, I, I just think that from, you know, in terms of the process of me creating the artwork, I am a lot more aware of what I'm doing and how it could impact the environment, you know, the kinds of materials that I'll use. Um, uh, I think I told you, uh, Patrick, that, you know, even the material, the, the containers that I use for my adhesives or whatever, I'll use like old, um, yogurt and plastic yogurt caps you know instead of throwing them away like pretty much anything I, i'm i'm way more aware of you know what i may put into a trash bin you know since since you know i'd say for the last 14 years 15 years or so and and um but in terms of the content of my artwork i can't really say that it's um the you know climate change has has really played a role in you know how I create something or any, or just the creative process in any way. I don't know. I that... Same here. Uh, it's, it's not really affected my artwork, but it's affected my life. I mean, I use all recycled packaging materials when I send things out to people. I do art fairs across the country. So I have a vehicle that is as small as I can get away with almost to the point of insanity that uh, everything fits in it. Uh, yeah, you know, same same here. I, Amy, I I use I mean, at shows. I'll use um, you know for my displays. I use newspapers in my displays, and I use um, you know egg cartons, you know old old paper, cardboard egg cartons and things. Just anything that can be you know repurposed and stuff. I you know I like I like to do that. So I'm on the, the same wavelength. Is, as the bonus is it's making people aware and little things like using an egg yeah. carton. Yeah. 
I will admit that I have adopted the role of a recycling evangelist for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that that um, I'm hardcore. And I, I actually physically and emotionally feel like I carry a burden with me that I want my work to address these issues. And for the past eight or 10 years, I've been working on a long-term project, which is called the 10 Modern Plagues. And many of these modern plagues actually deal with what we've done to our environment, whether it's invasive species or climate change. There are a lot of ways that we've, um, mankind has impacted our environment in the most negative way. And I, uh, I'll envy those people who can uh, feel and enjoy the entertainment aspect because um, I, I actually uh, take it really super seriously that I want to bring awareness to the issues. I think that's something that Glenn really covered in um, his article um, of your work in Ornament. That was an excellent article. He did a great job. That was, you never know. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. I was gonna add that um, within my work that I've kind of, um, that, I, that I do um, kind of more unconsciously, I think is, um, is I'll actually repurpose older uh, works of mine that I'll that I've made, um, and I'll just turn I'll just keep turning them into different things. It's <laughs> it's kind of funny because you know if someone sees a work um, at an art show or you know pre pandemic, um, and you know then they would see it again at a different one. You know if I didn't you know sell it um, and. Uh, they're like, didn't, didn't, didn't that, was that the same one or did you make another one or, and it's like, no, nah, I just, I just decided to change it. I decided to like, just be purpose the actual piece itself. You know I mean? I'll like take pieces and I'll like, you know, some other, other works that I've made and I'll put them together. And, um, you know, instead of totally trying to make something completely new and wasting new material, you know, um, this usually just worked with what you got. I think it's usually what works pretty good. It ties right back into what uh, I think it was Holly Ann was talking about and Patrick, how so many cultures that didn't have the overabundance of materials use what was available. So what might've been tin cans in New Mexico that were old lard tins. So your tin art came from an available material or what's happening in Africa where they don't have, they can't go to the store like Michael's. This mm. over, you know, the so-called craft supply store so they can go buy their craft materials. That, you know, they're using what's available and you're using what's available to you too, which might be your work and it might have a new vision that's better or different yeah absolutely um i mean even with um like the classes that i've that i've taught um i usually just save random material that i either have accumulated because i mean that just happens let's just admit that we just accumulate all kinds of random things throughout our day throughout our lives you know and um i think about how I could repurpose it or turn it into something or save it um, for my students to use for projects and things like that. Um, I think that's a great way to um, just learn and just learning how to use the materials. And then they kind of ex start exploring it, you know, like, well, how was this made or why is this made? And, you know, and I think once you start with one question, it, it just snowball, snowballs into like a numerous amount of other questions, you know? It really does. And uh, I just want to loop back a little bit because um, Holly, when you were talking about yogurt containers, I believe you said that you were using Nusa yogurt <laughs> containers. Yeah, to be specific, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad loves those. He, he hoards them to like put his little bits and, you know, of extra sprues and other things in there. Yeah, they're very useful. That's true. <laughs> 
They're made out of very good plastic, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My brother does yeah. that. He does that with little tins, like little, uh, I've seen it on his workbench. He uses like little tins that he keeps all his little stamps in and it's like perfect. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea, you know, yeah. like just <laughs> pick up little things on what people do, you know, like in their <laughs> shops and their homes and like everything. So um, moving on to the next topic, which is a little bit um, bringing it to what something we've all been dealing with uh, this past year. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of our lives uh, pretty immensely. And uh, I'd like to, because that's another part of, you know, with climate change, that's something that we're, is a very immediate reality that we're all dealing with. And so in regards to the pandemic, I'd like you to all to talk a little bit about how it's affected you, whether personally or professionally. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, well, obviously, as someone who sells their work primarily at art shows, I'm not doing any more of them, but I'm, I've pivoted and I'm selling more off of my website. And what I've learned from this whole pandemic, the, uh, I've learned a couple of things. The, the biggest one being that I don't have to work as hard as I had been. Just I was on this hamster meal, wheel, hamster wheel constantly scrambling to get enough work together to do the next art show. And now I'm taking more time and experimenting and creating new things that I never had the time to do because I was trying to make stuff that was saleable. And the other thing that I found myself doing, I had pieces, tins and toys and things that I had had for years, but I hadn't used them because they were just too good. I know I'm never gonna find another one. I can't use that. And it's like, I could die tomorrow, I'm using it now. So I'm using all the good stuff. I think for me with the pandemic, I um, wouldn't, you know, especially in spring of last year, I really didn't feel much inspiration to do my artwork. It was just sort of trying to, you know, find my equilibrium and, and you know, so I, have days and days of newspapers that are just stacked up I remember and they just you know I didn't have feel any inspiration to make anything and then um, you know I guess I, I got to a point maybe by uh, early summer of last year that you know I mean I guess similar to what Amy was saying it's like I could use this time as a blessing to you know create pieces that you know probably a year earlier, I would have given anything to have, you know, this time to, you know, produce artwork and, you know, because you're always traveling from show to show to show to show to show and getting ready for the next show and, you know, making sure you have your most sellable bread and butter type pieces and instead I could just use the time to create. So um, I, you know, I, I, that's really what, you know, sort of got my um, creative engine flowing again and, you know, I've, having looked back it's just you know I at this point I just sort of consider it you know a blessing you know in disguise you know I can't wait to do shows again I miss the interaction with people really miss it but you know I'm just using this time to uh you know focus on my art you're here yeah same <clears throat> same I'm, I'm totally doing the same about it um you know before the pandemic I was uh working full-time as an assistant curator and um because of the institutional uh, financial hardships um they had to let me go and um but I think maybe in a lot of ways it was a blessing in disguise because I really was able to really dive into my own work and really just dedicate that time and and um focusing on my artwork and um developing a website and trying to um figure out you know how to make those sales without the in-person art shows because the ones I had signed up for they all got canceled um so I'm really happy also to to be here with you all um you know it's 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 like I said it's a blessing in disguise how how that all kind of worked out um and uh I just I think what I've learned in this past year I hope to continue um on within my own work and then um the things that I learned as um 
trying to learn how to be business savvy online, <laughs> which is like a whole new ball game. <laughs> um, so, you know, one step at a time. Past year has been very hard. The past year has been, and I'll echo, I think it was Holly that said that in the first couple of months, you were a little bit in shock. It's not that I did crap shows or anything, but the whole just social emotional impact of what was happening and how, how can we adapt? So the ability to adapt essentially has been the hallmark of success for so many companies that adapted to whatever the changing landscape was, whether it was the marketplace, using your website, being a little bit more entrepreneurial and you're on your own about or refocusing on your internal, you know, right? Like you always had that skill, you always had that knowledge inside of you or those those pieces, but now you get to focus like Dorothy mm -hmm. and Wizard of Oz. You always had that power inside, but you have to draw on that power. You realize that it can't be from another trip or another show. It has to come from you on the inside and go out. That's so true. I think that uh, we could we could literally go on for another hour or so with <laughs> with all the things that we have to say about this topic. But I would like to um, uh, give us a chance to answer some of the questions from the audience. Um, so uh, there's a few questions here um, that uh, Twig will be uh, posing to the panelists. And uh, if you want to have your question answered, now's the time to do it. Um, actually, we have two um, directed towards Amy. Um, the first one is, can you will you make custom orders with stuff that other people have collected? I do enjoy that, but I tell people to send me pictures first because pixels are cheap to send before we get the post office involved. Because okay. not everything that people want to use is workable. Right. So a good piece of advice would be to go to your craft optimism store and um, I mean, that's a way to send you an email. Yes, yes. Okay, and the second question is, when you begin a piece, um, do you start with an idea first or are you inspired by the found objects that you have lying around? It's usually starting from the objects. It's a terrible thing to have an idea and not have the, the parts to fulfill it. So what I do is I take the piece that started the whole thing, usually the body, I have a big table, I put it down and then I just mix and match other pieces around it to get an idea of how it would look when it was all done. And when I've got everything arranged the way I like it, I solder it and bolt it together. Excellent. Um, here's another one. Um, I'd like for the post pen, I should, I should read it before I read it out loud. Um, this person says, I'd like for the post pandemic art market to be spread between art shows and online sales. Do you think you hope art sales will stay less dependent on shows in the future? So I guess the question is, what do you think is the trend and what would you like as far as your own business, as far as live uh, shows and online events? Well, for me, I, I wanna, I, I think that it would, from a business standpoint, um, doing the in-person shows are best because um, I find that people are very tactile. Like they wanna see it for their, see the, the artwork for themselves, you know, is it, you know, how fragile, how durable is the, the jewelry? Cause it is made of, uh, you know, paper. So I think that it, um, online, it kind of loses that, you know, I, I lose that ability to connect with people, you know, from a business, from a business standpoint. And then just personally, you know, it's, you know, as an artist, you know, I, I love having that feedback and interaction, whether a person at a, at an in-person show buys a piece or doesn't buy a piece, you know, it's still, feel, you know, something that I, I need on a personal level to interact with people. So I, I hope that, you know, I mean, I do like the virtual shows, you know, and I appreciate them, 
but I really look forward to the in-person shows again. Yeah, I kind of look forward to both. I hope that both kind of continue and kind of um, can hybrid somehow. Um, I feel that a lot of um, people have been kind of forced into learning how to, you know, use all these new online platforms and Zoom and um, all of it. I mean, I know that I've definitely have been one to figure out how to make sales online and via the website. And um, so, I mean, I think that's just the future. You know, I think that if we can continue to figure out how to um, incorporate incorporate that, you know, for people who can't make it to these art shows, um, you know, and hopefully we can just learn from what we've done and continue that. Um, but I do agree with the, it is, especially for like jewelry and things like that. I mean, it's hard. Um, people do want to, it's tangible. It's a tangible object. They want to try it on. They want to see how it feels, you know, how heavy things are like, I, I totally agree. So that's, I don't know, unless, we, unless there's some new future VR something that can do it like that. I don't know. <laughs> would, would you think that you would have a live show with an online component at one time, or would you have some live shows and some online events separate? Both. Hmm. The, uh, having an online sh um, web presence is absolutely imperative to make it uh, these days. I can't believe when I hear of an artist that says they don't have a website. You, you have to have a website, but you have to have a way of getting people to go to your website. And everyone that goes, almost everyone that goes to my website is somebody that I've met at a show and has taken my card and has signed the mailing list. I yeah, I agree. I think, sorry, I, I think you do have to have a website for sure. I mean, um, I mean, that technology has been around for a n number of years, you know, prior to the pandemic. So it's time we all catch up. <laughs> yeah, online, an online presence is a great way to reach out to a much wider audience. And there, there can be value to both. But I do think a website is the future. And your website can be much more than just about selling something. It could be also a uh, archive of past work, uh, a resource for somebody who's interested in your work for uh, to write an article, for example, like an ornament magazine. Uh, that the more you can develop your online presence, and that includes doing something like Instagram or Facebook, depending upon your demographic, so that something like Instagram can be a way to draw people to your website. Yeah, I'm slowly but surely learning that, you know, I have to really beef up that social media yeah. presence because I'm very like shy by nature. So, you know, it's very hard for me to like, you know, post things on social media because I'll suck and guess myself constantly but you know just it's just another way you know that you really have to put yourself out there and you know there are artists that I have just enormous respect for just like Francesca another paper jewelry artist Francesca Vitale you know she's you know Deborah Adelson those are you know artists jewelry artists that are like exceptionally good at social media and you know and you know that I'm sure it, it is um, reflected in their sales and stuff but for me I'm just trying to get myself out there so it's just you know this pan you know this pandemic and not having in-person shows anymore sort of forced me to do that you know I, I would also like to add that posting images either on your website or social media may not actually be only about self-promotion and if you change that mindset into the idea that you're sharing there are people that are actually desperate for the entertainment or they're looking for something that's interesting. And so therefore you're sharing a resource rather than promoting your work. It, just a slight difference in the mindset might make you feel more comfortable about posting your images. That's a good point. It's true, thank you. Um, somebody asks, how many of your sales are international or I guess what percentage of your business ends up overseas. 
Okay, I'll go. Um, I'd say about 3% because I discourage people from <laughs> overseas from buying my work because I will spend weeks biting my nails, wondering if it's going to get there safely. And I have had people call me furious because customs were like a hundred dollars and how dare I? <laughs> for, for a, a world that's global in so many respects, including the pandemic, uh, mail is definite and all the problems involved with international shipping is definitely not global and with ease. There's too many problems. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I agree. It's the national sales are, are definitely tricky. It's expensive. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. my last piece I think I sent to the Philippines, and um, I mean, I paid more in the shipping and everything than that. I was able, to, you know, in the actual artwork itself. So it was like, but I don't know. They really wanted it. So that was cool. I was really happy for them to like my work. All right, so we're probably getting close to wrapping up, but we had one more question about, are you all passing along your talent and teaching others to create sustainably? I guess, Harriet, I'm particularly interested in, since your work is so intentional, um, how, are you, how are you passing it along? I would really like to find an apprentice. So it's... <laughs> If somebody's out there looking to learn about what it's like to develop their metalworking skills and really and truly work, then I'm looking for somebody. Um, I don't teach. It just didn't fit within my like lifestyle situation or whatever. But I would certainly love to have uh, I had Emiko Oi working for me. Maybe some of you know or who are listening. Emiko worked for me for about 15 years. And she learned a lot about what it takes to be an artist and develop her work. And I could teach somebody that skill set if they were interested as long and also help them with their metalworking skills if they were interested. Nice. Um, anybody else passing along your skills? I'm available if anybody uh, wants to send me an email, I'll you know, tell me what their problem uh, craft-wise is. Just, uh, <laughs> I will answer any questions that I can, but I do not teach because there are just, there's a hundred different ways to get hurt doing what I do. And I have no problem with my own pain, but I can't stand to see somebody else get hurt. So yeah, if I can, if I can answer your questions, Right to me. Right. All right. Um, Patrick, is there anything else that we want to um, finish on? Uh, I, I think that more or less wraps it up, except uh, my father actually just came in with a question for Harriet. Great. Which is, how do you saw out the intricate shapes on the tin cans in your work? Okay, well, for, I have an undergraduate education in metalsmithing, a graduate school education in metalsmithing, and I don't want to date myself, but about 40 years of professional skills working as both a jeweler and silversmith, I have a lot of technical skills. And what I'm really doing is taking a very traditional skill set working with metal and it's translated right into what essentially is a very non-precious materials. I, it's just plain old fashioned craft skills that I kind of camouflage a little bit with like concept. Well, um, Harry Estelle Berman and Holly Ann Mitchell and Amy Flynn and Wayne Nez Goswin and most certainly Patrick Benish Lu. Thank you all very much for being part of this very interesting discussion. And thank you, Patrick, for drawing attention to Smithsonian craft optimism, which is, uh, you can actually access it right now 
Um, and it will be open until May 1st and sales are off to a brisk pace. So if there are things you're interested in and people don't have much uh, merchandise on hand, I encourage anybody listening to go shop now. <laughs> uh, it, and I guess that's it. It's, it's truly been a pleasure. And uh, thank you Twig for being a wonderful hostess for the panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.